Greetings book lovers everywhere. I'm E-Train and welcome to E-Train Talks. And today, I am so grateful to be joined by none other than Lisa Phipps, the debut middle grade author of the award-winning and downright amazing novel and verse, Starfish. And I know so many people listening and watching admire you, Lisa, as much as I do, and are beyond grateful for your novel. You wrote your truth and inspired, motivated, and gave others the courage to speak theirs. And I'm especially thrilled to be talking to you today because you were the first author to ever give me feedback on one of my book reviews, which of course was my review of your extraordinary novel in verse, Starfish. And now, without further delay, I'm so pleased to welcome award-winning author and amazing person, Lisa Phipps. I am so excited to be here today, E. I am, like seriously. I think you're the coolest human ever. So I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm so happy that you're here as well. And it's just a huge honor. I know that so many people have been looking forward to this interview and just really everything that you're doing. So I'm excited to talk about um, maybe some sneak peeks of any new projects, your just your novel in general, and your career as a writer and just sur- being surrounded by books. Okay. And now let's get into my first question. All righty. So one of my favorite quotes in Starfish is, it's unknown how many students' lives librarians have saved by welcoming loners at lunch. Mm -hmm. And this is such an important and sentimental message. And I'm curious to know if there are any librarians that perhaps made an impact on your life at a young age as they did for Ellie. One billion percent, not even a, not even a hundred percent, one billion percent, because um, when I was in elementary school, I had a, an amazing librarian named Mrs. Pochon, and she was originally from Canada, so she had a, a kind of a strong Canadian accent, right? And every single time I walked into that library, and I did every time I got a chance, um, she always greeted me with a giant smile, and she always had somewhere on her desk whether it was right on top, if it was like she knew I was coming in that day or she'd have it down below if she wasn't sure when I was coming in. And she'd go, Lisa, I have some great books I know you're going to love. And the fact that, A, she smiled at me when so many kids and even some teachers, to be honest, were like mean to me because I was different and, and had a different size body was right there, just alone, the smile, you know, was, would have been enough to make me adore her. But when I knew that when, even when I wasn't around, she was thinking about me and thinking about my love for books and literature and thinking of what I would like, that just, you know, when you're, you're rejected and, and bullied at every turn, and then you find someone who smiles at you and they're thinking of you in positive ways, it's life-changing. And um, she even got to the point, we, we, we developed this amazing relationship. And she even got to the point where she had me be her advisor, like her student advisor. And so she would get books to evaluate, to decide whether or not to buy them for the school. And she'd say, help me evaluate them. And so I got to read like books before anyone else did. And it was just like, and then she, that made me feel special too, right? And then as I went on into... Um, you know, junior high and high school, I had similar librarians in that, that school building as well. And they, they technically, you weren't supposed to go in the library during lunchtime, but they never said a word. They let me come in. They let me do my thing. They knew, they knew I was hiding from all the bullies. They knew that, they knew that, right? Like they never said it, but they knew it was unspoken, but they, they allowed it. And, and, um, They welcomed me, you know, with a smile too. And then when I was in college, I went to Ball State University and I hung out a lot at the library to study because I had some roommates who were really like not studious type people and I was. And plus I just love being around a library. And I even took a a course in being in in librarian, um, like how to be a librarian, the basic course. So uh, libraries have always been in my life. But yes, librarians, I do think they make a difference in so many ways, not only in befriending uh, the kids who are not being befriended elsewhere, but just the fact that they try, and especially right now in today's society, they try to, to like fight for the right for all of us to be able to read what we want to read 
you know, and to make sure that there are books on the shelves that represent everybody and that are written by everybody. So that's world and life changing. Yeah, librarians really are life changing. And if any of you watching are librarians, you're incredible people. And take it from Lisa Phipps, like mm -hmm. an, an amazing and inspiring person. You were so like everybody is so grateful for your impact that you've made on so many kids' lives. And I love your answer, Lisa. And it's mm -hmm. it's so true. Like, and the quote in your novel in verse Starfish, librarians really have made an impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that your whole novel in verse, it's not just like it may be considered realistic fiction, but it's also the truth. There's mm -hmm. so much truth to your book. And that just makes it even more special. And I'm interested to know, and I'm sure everyone else is listening is interested as well. Why did you decide to write Ellie's story in verse? You know, I think it was probably a combination of things. One of which is that, um, you know, Ellie and I are so much alike, right? Um, and her story aligns with my story. And I, I always tell people that Ellie got the watered down version of my life. Um, but, you know, I think in terms of poetry, like if I, if I had to sit down today and just write an essay of what today has been like, it would end up as a poem because that's how I think. And, um, and so I think part of it is that. And then, and then the other thing is, it's really interesting. My writing process is a little different. I mean, I, I've heard I've I've heard from other writers that they do this as well, but it's not as say common as as some. But like when I when I decided I wanted to write this book, when I because I've always wanted to write children's books, um, but when I you know sat down and started working on it, I was just like, okay, this book doesn't exist, which I found that hard to believe. That after all, I needed this book when I was a kid, and so when it didn't exist yet, I was like, wow, okay. So when I sit down to write it, I thought, how do I tell my truth? How do I tell my story, but yet not it be my story, right? I mean, um, and and so I wanted it to be contemporary. Mm -hmm. And and so I got these little um, video clips in my head. And that's what that's how my writing begins is you think of like a Marvel movie trailer kind of thing where you start to see like, oh, this is this. Thanos guy is a bad guy and yeah. this is sort of the havoc he's going to wreak and so um I and and so I get like these little movie trailers and I got these movie trailers of Ellie um in the pool and then I started getting some movie trailers of Catalina and the other characters and then I thought okay I get it I, I get her story now I can use my experiences and my emotions to tell her story and so that's how I put it together. And so every time I sit down to write, I would write a, like, you know, I would get a, um, a video clip and I would sit down to write and a poem would come out. And I was like, at the time, I didn't realize you could write a novel in verse. I'm like you, I didn't realize it was a thing. And so I was just like, oh, Lisa, you, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> and I thought, well, at least I'm getting my ideas out, right? And so um, I would take the, not the, the, the poem and I would try to turn it into prose and I hated it that way. I mean, I, I did it, but I hated it. It just wasn't doing what, it wasn't accomplishing what I wanted to accomplish with her story. And so I picked up a book when I was in a bookstore and it stopped pretending what happened when my big sister went crazy. And it's by Sonia Soames and it's a, an adult, a young adult novel. And when I opened the page and I saw that it was a novel in verse and I was like, <gasps> okay, you can write a whole book like this. And so then I was like, you, once I read my first novel in verse, I read every novel in verse seriously yeah. that existed at the time. And then uh, as I started working on Starfish. And so um, that's sort of how that comes about. And, and I'm working on some other books, you know, writers were always working on more yeah. than one. And some of them are coming out more in prose and some of them are coming out in a combination and some of them are coming out in verse. And so I just, I go with whatever the character, you know, they're, the, I see it as the character speaks to me their own way. And some of them speak more in prose than in verse and vice versa. And then some things lend themselves more to verse or, or prose, depending, you know. 
So I heard there's a rumor that there's going to be a sequel to Starfish. And is this true? And if so, can you share any sneak peeks for everyone listening? Well, the rumor is kind of half true, half not true. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. Um, you know, I never wrote it with the idea of, I'll write a sequel to this. Yeah. Um, and the very first author visit I had with a school in Arkansas, the very first question from this little boy was, is there going to be a prequel or a sequel? <laughs> and I had to laugh. And I told him, I'm not laughing at your question. It's a great question. And I appreciate you asking it. I'm laughing because I never thought of that. You know what I mean? I just never thought of it. I guess I'm the type, and I think this probably comes from my, my background as a journalist. I was a journalist before, is that I don't think in terms of sequels. I mean, like, yeah, like, for example, when there's a tornado, you write about the tornado happening. And then the next day you write about, like, yeah. the the yeah, damage, you know, and there's some some little bit of it like a sequel, but most of the time journalists are hit and run, right? They do a yeah. story and then they're done with it. And um, so I I was I wasn't thinking that way. And then um, but the more people talk to me, the more I think, could I, should I, and what would it be? So <laughs> I'm actually wondering about that because I actually did an author event earlier this week, and the same question was like, can we see her like a little bit older and we want to know you know how she is now so maybe it would be like a young adult novel I was like I don't know and then someone else was like can you write another middle grade novel but like focus more maybe on like uh, Viv or um, Enemy 3 or you know what I mean and so I don't know I'm thinking about it so yeah kind of half true half not true rumor <laughs> and either way if there is no sequel or prequel or maybe um, a story about one of the other characters. I'm still excited to see where your writing journey takes you. And I also feel, I feel like that, I feel like Ellie's story has been told, but I feel like there's more to the story. And mm -hmm. I know that everybody who read Starfish, they really want to see another book in the series. Maybe not a sequel to Ellie's story, mm -hmm. but just something about that universe. And maybe Catalina. Catalina is who I'm really thinking about a lot as a character mm -hmm. after reading Starfish five times. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And you know, the, the thing about Catalina, though, not to interrupt, is that, you know, her story is an immigrant story. And even though my grandmother was an immigrant, I am not an immigrant. And I feel like there are enough writers who are immigrants and, and that they should tell that story. Yeah. So I wouldn't say Catalina wouldn't be in another book, but she would still be a secondary character um, because I, I just feel like in own voices is very important. You know, I mean, like I would I don't think it would have been OK if someone who had never been fat tried to write Starfish. That's true. You're right. And so I think an, someone who has an immigrant story should tell an immigrant story. That's such a true message. And now, speaking of your work as a journalist, my next question is about your journalist journey. Journalist mm -hmm. journey. Um, so Hard to say, I, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I know that you used to be an award-winning journalist. And I remember on an event, you said that you wrote about hilarious topics like llamas and more. And this sounds so silly and just mm -hmm. fun and exciting to talk about. Mm -hmm. So will you share some tidbits about your journey as a journalist? Wow, mm -hmm. journals, um, that's hard to say. And how it, it led to becoming it? a middle grade author? Yeah, so, um, yeah, sure. So you're saying, you're asking like some of my, some of my things that I've covered or done or. Yeah, you know, like about what okay. you've covered and how it kind of led to Starfish and just writing okay. middle grade. Okay, I want to make sure I had your question yeah. right. So, you know, it's interesting because journalists never really get trained. I mean, we, we go through, obviously, college and get a degree in it. Um, but, and, you know, where you learn about journalism law and all that. But <laughs> your first day on the job is usually something along the lines of, okay, you're going to be covering the police beat. So go down to the police station and read all the reports, see if there's something that sounds interesting. And they just, you're on your own, right? You there's not like someone like walking you through it. They're just go do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I love that though. I'm a very independent person and I prefer to just do my own thing. Um, so that really worked for me. But, you know, 
it was interesting because you have to think so quickly on your feet, right? So I remember driving, I, when I first started, I had, um, I was covering like a small town that was, and then reporting back to a, a larger newspaper. And so I was driving to work and I see this fire like 10 miles away. I mean, it's huge, just this wow. huge black plume of smoke. And my first thought was, I hope I didn't leave anything on in the office and burn it down. <laughs> and so as I'm driving, I, I immediately start going into, okay, what all do I need to do? And of course I instantly went to, uh, and got, grabbed the camera. And then I went to the fire. And, you know, so, cause I'm like, I don't know if the actual photographer is going to get here in time before all the good, and I put that in quotes, all the good flames are gone, right? Yeah. Because you want to get, you want to really represent the horrificness of what you're covering. So I was like, by the time he gets here, it was 13 miles away. I was like, I don't know if it's going to be all out and it's just going to be like, because there's black smoke when it's in full, it's, it's in full um, active fire and it gets gray as it goes down. And so I was like, we need the black smoke. We need those flames. I'm taking pictures. I'm asking questions. I'm writing them down. I'm thinking, who all can I talk to? I see witnesses standing around. And, and I do all this and I'm interviewing everybody. And I'm trying to take details of like step by step what the firefighters are doing. And, you know, and then the photographer did get there and they ended up using some of mine and some of his photos. And, um, but those are some, that was like my third day on the job. Really? Right. Yeah. So those are kinds of how it works. And I love that, though. Um, but then I had some some good experiences too. some fun. You just never know what you're going to cover. That's the fun part yeah. of being a journalist. <laughs> is you, fun. Yeah. You wake up every day and like I got a call. Hey, we're teaching llamas how to square dance. <laughs> we think that would be a cool story. And I'm like, I think that'd be a cool story. Yeah. too. Where are you and how do I get there? And and then I go to the llama farm and I, I see how they've taught them how to swear dance. And that was a fun story because actually Jay Leno and David Letterman, who are legends who are now no longer in TV, they they like jumped off my story. The Associated Press jumped off my story. And um, the people got so many calls that they literally blew up their answering machine really? uh, <laughs> from that. Uh, um and then, you know, and then I've done some, some really sad stories. I've did stories about um, people who were uh, unhoused and like how this, these two pregnant women were living in a car because they couldn't find a home and afford a home. And there was a long wait list. And then there was a woman and her husband and her mother who were living under a bridge because our community did not have a shelter for homeless or unhoused, sorry, people. It just had, you had two shelters, you had women and children and you had men. So if you were married, they put the husband in one and the wife and children really? in the other. Yeah. And I found that to be exceptionally cruel because, you know, when you're unhoused and you've lost literally everything, you only have your family left and then they split you up. And so um, what was amazing was um, a, a church, local church, who realized, you know, the benefit of, hey, you know, we talk about God and we talk about love. And but if we're not actually helping people, they're never going to believe in a God. Right. And so they contacted me to get more information about these people. Then they contacted the local people and they raised money and bought a house. And now there is um, a shelter for families in our community. So I, that's my favorite story ever, because when every time I pass that house, I'm like, if I had never written that story, families would still be being separated. And so there's fun stuff, you know, there's exciting stuff, there's scary stuff. Like, you know, I used to write about criminals, obviously, <laughs> and I would get letters from prisons and threats and things like that. So there's this huge gamut, you know, and you just never know every day when you go to work what you're going to face. And so how that plays into my writing is, first of all, I'm a huge researcher. Like if you were to look to see, and you know, Starfish is very much based on my life, right? But if you were to see my bookmarks for Starfish, you know, off the internet, everything I want to talk about, I go and make sure there's proof behind what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Like when I talk about uh, bariatric surgery for children, there are, you know, I found where people who, 
children who are three and five and seven and 12 as becoming a common number 12. Uh, and I would like bookmark that. And I'm just a huge researcher. Uh, and then also I'm just, I'm it really, you know, all those years I wrote at least, I think I lost track, but it's somewhere 6,000 or more articles in my lifetime. Wow. Yeah. And if you think about the fact that I kind of had a personal rule of trying to get at least three sources per article. So three people times 6,000. So I interviewed at least 18,000 people. So I pick up on dialogue and I pick up on mannerisms. And so that helps me when I'm creating characters. So everything that seems like, oh, that, you know, how would journalism apply to, um, you know, writing a book? Very much so. And if you think about it, there are some, you know, Hemingway, Mark Twain, and others were journalists long before they wrote books. So it all, to me, tied together. Your whole career has been pretty much surrounded by stories, whether mm -hmm. they're news stories, stories in a library, or now your own story. So mm -hmm. looking back, is this something that you think young Lisa would have wanted? Would they like be, be super duper happy that, wow, future me has the job of a lifetime? Or do you think that there were any other paths that you would have considered prior to your writing journey? Oh my gosh, Ethan. You're so good at this job. I'm just telling you right now. Thank like, you. you're just really good at this. So um, when I was a little girl, I used, I, all of, I grew up in a neighborhood where all of the ch children were older than me, like significantly older. Like when I was in second grade, some of them were getting married older, you know what I mean? And so I kind of had to be my own playmate, which I was fine with that though, because A, my personality, but I love the arts. So I would sit under this Rose of Sharon tree in our backyard. It was, it's technically a bush, but ours was overgrown and it was literally a giant tree. And I would read, write, draw, and listen to music. So all the arts, right? Yeah. And I thought I want to write and illustrate children's books. I mean, that was just what I wanted to do. And um, so, you know, I studied art a lot. I took private art lessons. And one of my fun stories to tell is I would always tell my mom, I'm boring. I created a word, right? Boring with an ED. And I was like, I'm boring. I'm going to go create something. And she's like, okay. <laughs> so um, we had a very long white hallway wall. And one day I looked at it and I was like, oh, that's a canvas, right? Yeah. So I grabbed the black crayon. And I drew all over it, like this masterpiece that probably would have ended up in the Louvre. Yeah. But anyway, I, um, I went and got my mom, had her close her eyes, led her into the hallway to show her this beautiful masterpiece I created. And um, yeah, it didn't go well. <laughs> so, you know, art critics are everywhere all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so... She gave me a bucket of soapy water and said, clean it. And so I did. And I cleaned it all up. But then I was like, I have another blank can. <laughs> so I did it. It's a never ending over. cycle. I know. And so I did that for years until finally I, I, you know, she bought me enough art supplies that I was just like, you know, the really good stuff. And then she repainted the wall. But um, so I think what I'm do, say all that to say is that, you know, I've always wanted to tell stories and I didn't have really the best, the best childhood. And there's some other issues that I haven't talked about in Starfish that happened. And so um, I was like uh, trying to escape my house, but you know, when you're a kid, you can't really like just yeah. run away. Although I did have a brief attempt to run away <laughs> when I was a child, but um so sitting under that tree and reading allowed me to escape my life, right? And enter yeah. someone else's life and, and, and also be inspired by other people and to think creatively. And then also I did that with my drawing. I could create the worlds that I wanted to live in instead of the world I had to live in. And so I think that to me is the power of story is the, how it transports you and how you can transport your readers. And so, but yeah, stories have always been in me all along. And, um, and I have always appreciated and seen the power of words and stories because I actually see words like 
paint supplies or art supplies. Like just if you know, if you want to think about words, to me they're a brush, they're the paint, they're the clay, and you shape and form them however you want. And there are so many messages and themes interwoven into starfish, like friendship and acceptance. But if you were to name another message you'd want your readers to take away from your beautiful novel and verse, what would it be? Hmm. You know, one of the things I think, and and I don't know that I I realized it would have this big of an impact when I wrote it, obviously, but. Mm -hmm. I think from reader feedback, what it does is it really is that door and it is that window and that door, right? So for all the people who have lived Ellie's life, they finally see themselves in literature and re represented authentically. And I think that's like crucial considering 70% of Americans are fat. And, um, you know, 70% of the market has been ignored for far too long, not just in literature, but in social media and media and the movies and everywhere. Uh, and so I think that's crucial, but I think that door too is crucial because I hear so many people, I actually got a beautiful letter from um, someone who had been in the publishing industry for years, very well respected. And um, she said, oh my gosh, Lisa, my, I had some fat relatives and I was always ashamed of them. And yet I've, I, I wanted to defend them and you have captured what that is like, right? Um, and so I related to the mother because I understand that what she was really probably trying to do was like spare Ellie from pain because having grown up with a sister who was fat, Ellie's mom knew what Ellie was facing in a different way than Ellie did. And I think that the mom was trying to spare her from pain. And I think she thought, well, if I just change Ellie, if I get Ellie to change, the pain will stop. But I don't think that, you know, she realized that really that wanting um, Ellie to change and therefore really not accepting Ellie as she was, was as hurtful, if not more hurtful than the other part of being fat and being uh, bullied. And so, and to have this person, you know, and I've had people say that, you know, this changed me. It changed how I see fat people. It changed me how I see myself. It changed me and I will never do that again. And, and I think that door window thing that happens with literature is essential. I mean, you know, I, you cannot be every person, you know, I cannot be, um, I cannot be another religion. I mean, you can always, you know. Yeah. Convert, but I mean, I can't be every single religion on the planet. I can't be every single culture on the planet. I can't be every single gender on the planet. But through reading, I can. Yeah. For the length of that book, and I can start to see into their lives through that door, and then parts of their story. Here's the great thing about story: is a part of everybody's story is a part of your story. And your story is a part of everyone else's story because we're all humans and we are in this world and life together. And so every book can be a door and a window for the reader and the writer. And it's just this, this tunnel of communication that you funnel through as you read. And I think, um, you know, I, I have so much more love and understanding of other cultures and religions and genders and everything because I read. My next question is a fun question that I like asking a lot of my guests. So if you were trapped on a deserted island and it could only bring one book, what book would it be and why? That's not very nice of you. <laughs> I mean, it could, it doesn't, yeah, I know. One, oh my gosh, it'd have to be an it, anthology. It, yeah, it could also See, could be cheat. a series if you'd like. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to pretend, I'm going to yeah. pretend that there has been an anthology made of every novel and verse ever written and every poem ever written. And it's yeah. one really <laughs> big book. I would love and that's that. the book I'll take. Um, Cause I'm one of those people, you know, my, my, I'm very eclectic in um, what I like to learn about and think about, you know, I mean, and you think about that again, it goes back to journalism. I've covered everything from test driving cars to writing about, you know, the breast cancer gene and 
everything in between. And so I have this huge, like, you know, span of knowledge and interest. And um, I watch documentaries. It's like one of my favorite things to do. I'll watch live surgeries. I mean, I'm just that girl. And so if you ask me one, (laughs) I'm going to find a way to cheat. I can't say one either. Yeah. It's an anthology of every yeah. poem and every novel and verse ever written in one giant volume. And that's <laughs> what I'll take to the island. And now it's time for my final question. The question I ask every single one of my guests, if you could be or meet any literary character, of course, um, you can't, it, not just one. It doesn't have to be just one. Although mm-hmm. if, if, it could be anybody, fictional or real. Who would it be and why? <sighs> Oy vey. Um, (laughs) okay you know this is a weird this might be a weird one to some people but um you know and 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 yes there's some criticism to him as a person uh and even him as a writer to some degree but I've always been fascinated with Ernest Hemingway Mm -hmm. um and uh because you know he was a journalist and he was an um expat and um an author and quite eccentric in many ways and and yet I under seem to understand that in a lot of ways so I would love to pick his brain I think you know um he just seemed like and I love his staccato He, he writes very staccato very uh um short very short sentences and and I love his the rhythm of his writing I mean just even if you take away you know some of his issues as a writer and as a human if you just study how he was able to use words he did it masterfully and um you know you always want to study the masters right if you're that's why they send art students to museums to like re you know to draw you know, Van Gogh's work or to Monet or, you know, um, Picasso. It's because you want to, you want to be in the presence of masters. And I think he's one of those that I want to know, especially since our lives are similar enough, you know, between being journalists and authors, Mm -hmm. I would just really love to pick his brain about his craft and how he crafted his words, how he used words. Well, that is such a great answer, and I'll have to look into some of Ernest Hemingway's works, or really just kind of, when I'm older, study how he writes. And maybe that's what I would do. Yeah, try and transport myself into his writing brain. And I can't tell you how happy I am to have had the chance to talk with you today, Lisa. The truth is without. Oh, thank you. And the truth is, without you, this podcast probably wouldn't exist. And I might not be interviewing authors and reviewing books. And it just, none of this would have happened without your positive feedback and just amazingly kind personality. You're the first author to listen and respond to one of my book reviews. The first author to send me a signed book play, which is in Mm -hmm. here. And the first author to support my social media efforts and just my writing journey in general. So I just gotta say thank you for everything. I haven't had a chance. This is our first Zoom meeting together. And I hope that I can say thank you in person one day. You're the kind of writer that lights up the room and makes the world smile. I can't wait to read whatever your next novel is. And I hope you'll come back and talk with me about it. Thanks so much for sharing your book journey, Lisa. And it has been such a pleasure. You are the best. Oh, thank you so much, E. Likewise, on all accounts. Thank you. And a lot to likewise, you're likewise back. <laughs> Well, likewise, till infinity and beyond. There we go. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) You're an incredible person. And everybody, if this interview hasn't persuaded you to get your hands on a copy of Starfish, well, I don't know what will. Lisa is, her answers were insightful, interesting, and just downright special. And I'm honored that I had the chance to talk to you today, Lisa, and everybody you need to get your hands on a copy of Starfish. And also, I think you should also check out Lisa Phipps' website. I haven't really mentioned it in the interviews today, but it's beautiful, like the whole setup and stuff, like the mosaics um, in the background. Like I did a lot of my research there, not just because I was looking for information, but also I was 
very just impressed and also inspired by your website format. The mosaics are, I love mosaics. Um, so I really have to agree with you on that account. And just that's all for today, everyone. Stay safe, keep reading, and just write your heart out and mm -hmm. follow your passion. Lisa did, and look where she is now. She was a journalist. She was worked in the library, which is super cool. And now she's a published author. I'll see you in the next one, everybody.